We are going to continue with the next section of Fahrenheit 451. As we can see from here in our notes, we're going to do pages 93 to 105, so the next 12 pages. You also see that I already have the notes here done. We'll go through these as they appear in the book. Um, but yeah, we the first recording of this didn't work, and I don't feel like rewriting the notes. So uh, we have those already down. Um, so we won't be adding those in like we normally would, but we'll just pull them up as they come up in the book. Who is it? Montag out here. What do you want? Let me in. I haven't done anything. I'm alone, damn it. You swear it? I swear. The front door opened slowly. Faber peered out, looking very old in the light and very fragile and very much afraid. The old man looked as if he had not been out of the house in years. He and the white plaster walls inside were much the same. There was white in the flesh of his mouth and his cheeks and his hair was white, and his eyes had faded with white and the vague blueness there. Then his eyes touched on the book under Montag's arm, and he did not look so old anymore and not quite as fragile. Slowly his fear went away. I'm sorry. One has to be careful. He looked at the book under Montag's arm and could not stop. So it's true. Montag stepped inside. The door shut. Sit down. Faber backed up, as if he feared the book might vanish if he took his eyes from it. Behind him, the door to a bedroom stood open, and in that room, a, a litter of machinery and steel tools were strewn upon a desktop. Montag only had a glimpse before Faber, seeing Montag's attention diverted, turned quickly and shut the bedroom door and stood holding the knob with a trembling hand. His gaze returned unsteadily to Montag, who now seated, who was now seated with the book in his lap. The book. Where did you? I stole it. Faber, for the first time, raised his eyebrows and looked directly into Montag's face. You're brave. No, said Montag. My wife's dying. A friend of mine's already dead. Someone who may have been a friend was burnt less than 24 hours ago. You're the only one I knew might help me to, might help me to see to see Faber's hands itched on his knees may i sorry montag gave him the book it has been a long time i'm not a religious man but it's been a long time faber turned the pages stopping here and there to read it's as good as i remember Lord, how they've changed it in our parlors these days. Christ is one of the family now. I often wonder if God recognizes his own son the way they've dressed him up, or is it dresses him down? He's a regular peppermint stick now, all sugar crystal and saccharin when he isn't making veiled references to certain commercial products that every worshiper absolutely needs. Faber sniffed the books. Do you know that books smell like nutmeg or... Some spice from a foreign land. I loved to smell them when I was a boy. Lord, there were a lot of lovely books once before we let them go. Faber turned the pages. Mr. Montag, you are looking at a coward. I saw the way things were going a long time back. I said nothing. One of the innocents who could have spoken up and out when no one would listen to the guilty... But I did not speak and thus became guilty myself. And when finally they set the structure to burn the books using the firemen, I grunted a few times and subsided, for there were no others grunting or yelling with me by then. Now it's too late. Faber closed the Bible. Well, suppose you tell me why you came here. Nobody listens anymore. I can't talk to the walls because they're yelling at me. I can't talk to my wife. She listens to the walls. I just want someone to hear what I have to say, and maybe if I talk long enough, it'll make sense, and I want you to teach me to understand what I read. Faber examined Montauk's thin, blue-jowled face. How did you get shaken up? What knocked the torch out of your hands? I don't know. We have everything we need to be happy, but we aren't happy. Something's missing. I looked around. The only thing I positively knew was gone. 
was the books I'd burned in 10 or 12 years. So I thought books might help. Let's pause there and go to our notes. So currently we have a couple things. Montag shows up at Faber's house and he asks Faber to teach him. Or uh, at this point he has referenced that he is looking for a teacher. But we can go ahead and mark that down as well. Uh, we also have that uh, Faber remembers when things first got bad and he's upset with himself because he didn't say more, which alludes to the poem, and then they came for me, which we'll pull up at the end, which was also written about the Nazis. Um, he also mentions that Jesus and religion are simply used to sell products now, uh, and depending on if you have a religious bent or what that is, you may or may not read things into that that I personally can't go into, um, but it is something to think about. Um, we also have a couple of words. We have saccharin, which is to be excessively sweet. We have other words too, but we haven't got to those yet, I suppose. So back to the book we go. You're a hopeless romantic, said Faber. It would be funny if it were not serious. It's not books you need. It's some of the things that once were in books. The same things could be in the parlor families today. The same infinite detail and awareness could be projected through radios or televisors, Better not. No. No, it's not books at all you're looking for. Take it where you can find it, in old phonograph records, old motion pictures, and an old friend. Look for it in nature and look for it in yourself. Books were only one type of receptacle where we stored a lot of the things we were afraid we might forget. There's nothing magical about them at all. The magic is only in what the books say, how they stitch the patterns of the universe together into one garment for us. Of course, you couldn't know this. Of course, you still can't understand what I mean when I say this. You are intuitively right. That's what counts. Three things are missing. Here we have one of our vocab words, intuitive, which means, as we can see here, something that one knows is true even without reason. So we want to keep that in mind. These are also three things that we're going to mark down in our notes. These are the things that, according to Faber, are missing from society. Number one, do you know why books such as this are so important? Because they have quality. And what does the word quality mean? To me, it means texture. The book has pores. It has features. This book can go under the microscope. You'd find life under the glass, streaming past an infinite profusion. The more pores, the more truthfully recorded details of life per square inch you can get on a sheet of paper, the more literary you are. That's my definition anyway. Telling detail, fresh detail, the good writers touch life often. The mediocre ones run a quick hand over her. The bad ones rape her and leave her to the flies. So the number one thing that is missing today that he believes Montag is looking for is texture, is the uh, ability to look at the ugliness and those things that don't make us perfect. So now do you see why books are hated and feared? They show the pores in the face of life. The comfortable people want only wax moon faces, poreless, hairless, expressionless. There's probably something in there about Instagram. He, uh, apply the metaphor. We are living in a time when flowers are trying to live on flowers instead of growing on good rain and black loam. Even fireworks for all their prettiness come from the chemistry of the earth, yet somehow we think we can grow feeding on flowers and fireworks without completing the cycle back to reality. Did you know the legend of Hercules and Antaeus? The giant wrestler, whose strength was incredible so long as he stood firmly on the earth. But when he was held rootless in midair by Hercules, he perished easily. If there isn't something in that legend for us today, in this city, in our time, then I am completely insane. Well, there we have the first thing I said we needed. Quality. Texture of information. And the second? Leisure. But with plenty of off hours. Off hours, yes. But time to think if you're not driving 100 miles an hour in a clip where you can't think of anything but the danger. Then you're playing some game or sitting in some room where you can't argue with a four-wall televisor. Why? 
televisor is real. It is immediate. It has dimension. It tells you what to think and blast it in. It must be right. It seems so right. It rushes on you so quickly to your own conclusions. Your mind hasn't had time to protest. What nonsense. Only the family is people. I beg pardon. My wife says books aren't real. Well, thank God for that. You can shut them. You can say, hold on a moment. And you play God to it. But who has ever torn himself from the claw that it closes you when you drop a seed in a TV parlor? It grows you any shape it wishes. It is an environment as real as the world. It becomes and it is the truth. Books can be beaten down with reason. But with all my knowledge and skepticism, I have never been able to argue with a 100-piece symphony orchestra, full color, three dimension, and being in and part of those incredible parlors. As you see, my parlor is nothing but four plaster walls. And here, he held out two small rubber plugs for my ears when I ride the subway jets. Denim's dentifrice, they toil not, neither do they spin, said Montag, eyes shut. So right here, um, he's trying to remember the, uh, the biblical passage he read about the lilies of the field, but he's getting that confused with the Denim's dentifrice stuff, which was being blasted at him. Where do we go from here? Would books help us? Only if the third necessary thing could be given us. Number one, as I said, quality of information. Number two, leisure to digest it. And number three, the right to carry out actions based on what we learn from our interactions of the first two. And I hardly think a very old man and a fireman turned sour could do much this late in the game. I can get books. You're running a risk. Well, that's the good part of dying. When you have nothing left to lose, you run any risk you want. There. You've said an interesting thing, laughed Faber, without having read it. There are things like that in books, but it came off the top of my mind. All the better. You didn't fancy it up for me or anyone, even yourself. Montag leaned forward. This afternoon, I thought that if it turned out books were worthwhile, we might get a press and print some extra copies. We? You and I. Let's pause and add to our notes. So we have uh, the intuitive, which we've already mentioned. We also have profusion, which is a large amount of something. You may have gotten that from the previous chapter. Uh, we have that uh, in our key events that Montag is having conclusions to the questions that he ask, is asking himself which is a very important thing. It's the next step in the escalation of, um, of learning, of education, to ask questions and then to reason out the answers to those questions. We also want to make mention of some of the things that Faber was talking about. Faber says that books don't have anything special. They just show the unfiltered truth of life. He said that there are three things that life is currently missing. One is the ugly truth. Everyone is so perfect. There's no contrast to life anymore. We need the truth not just what we want to see. Number two is time to digest information and sit in quiet. And number three is the freedom to act on that information. And then finally here, Montag says that when you have nothing to lose, you are willing to take big risks, which again is a fundamental truth of life. Big risks equal big reward. And if you need a big reward, you're willing to take big risks. Um, but you have to be careful that you're smart about those risks so that you avoid catastrophic failure. All right, let's go back and read more. Oh no, Faber sat up. Well, but let me tell you my plan. If you insist on telling me, I must ask you to leave. But aren't you interested? Not if you start talking the sort of talk that might get me burnt for my trouble. The only way I could possibly listen to you would be if somehow the fireman structure itself could be burnt. Now, if you suggest that we print extra books and arrange to have them hidden in firemen's houses all over the country so that seeds of suspicion would be sown among these arsonists, bravo, I'd say. Plant the books, turn an alarm, and see the firemen's house burn. Is that what you mean? Faber raised his brows and looked at Montag as if he were seeing a new man. I was joking. If you thought it would be a plan worth trying, 
I'd have to take your word it would help. You can't guarantee things like that after all. When we had all the books we needed, we still insisted on finding the highest cliff to jump off. But we do need a breather. We do need knowledge. And perhaps in a thousand years, we might pick smaller cliffs to jump off. The books are to remind us what asses and fools we are. They're Caesar's Praetorian Guard, whispering as the parade roars down the adventure. Remember, Caesar, thou art mortal. Many of us can't rush around, talk to everyone, know all the cities of the world. We haven't time, money, or that many friends. The things you're looking for, Montag, are in the world, but the only way the average chap will see 99% of them is in a book. Don't ask for guarantees and don't look to be saved in any one thing, person, machine, or library. Do your own bit of saving, and if you drown, at least die knowing you are headed for shore. Faber got up and began to pace the room. Well, asked Montag. Again, back to the notes we go. Uh, we want to mention here, books are useful for reminding us of our mistakes instead of just pretending to be perfect. Faber mentioned Caesar's Praetorian Guard, who as he rode through town, uh, to the adulation of the crowd celebrating his victories, would whisper in his ear, Momento mori, or remember that you're mortal. Don't get so caught up in your success and your adulations and your laurels that you forget that you're a human too and that you're capable of making mistakes and your mistakes have consequences. And that's what books do, is that they would allow us to look at our mistakes, not just progress the story for the sake of entertainment. You are absolutely serious. Absolutely. It's an insidious plan if I do say so myself. Faber glanced nervously at his bedroom door. To see the firehouses burn across the land destroyed as hotbeds of treason. The salamander devours his tail. Oh, God! There, with the salamander devouring his tail, he's referencing the, the Ouroboros, the uh, snake that eats itself, which is a, a symbol that you see all over. I have a list of firemen's residences everywhere with some sort of underground. Can't trust people. That's the dirty part. You and I, and who else will set the fires? Aren't there professors like yourself, former writers, historians, linguists, dead or ancient? Well, the older, the better. They'll go unnoticed. You know dozens, admit it. Oh, there are many actors alone who haven't acted Pirandello or Shaw or Shakespeare for years because their plays are too aware of the world. We could use their anger. And we could use the honest rage of those historians who haven't written a line for 40 years. True. We might form classes in thinking and reading. Yes. But that would just nibble the edges. The whole culture is the shot through. The skeleton needs melting and reshaping. Good God, it isn't as simple as just picking up a book you laid down half a century ago. Remember, the firemen are rarely necessary. The public itself stopped reading of its own accord. You firemen provide a circus now and then at which buildings are set off and crowds gather for the pretty blaze. But it's a small sideshow indeed and hardly necessary to keep things in line. So few want to be rebels anymore. And out of those few, most, like myself, scare easily. Can you dance faster than the white clown? Shout louder than Mr. Gimmick and the parlor families? If you can, you'll win your way, Montag, in any event. You're a fool. People are having fun. Committing suicide. Murdering. A bomber flight had been moving east all the time they talked. And only now did the two men stop and listen feeling the great jet sound tremble inside themselves. Patience, Montag. Let the war turn off the families. Our civilization is flinging itself to pieces. Stand back from the centrifuge. Well, there has to be someone ready when it blows up. What? Men quoting Milton, saying, I remember Sophocles, reminding the survivors that man has his good side too. They will only gather up their stones to hurl at each other. Montag, go home. Go to bed. Why waste your final hours racing about your cage denying you're a squirrel? Then you don't care anymore. I care so much I'm sick. And you won't help me. 
Good night. Good night. So we have a couple of other things that we're going to add here into our vocab. We have the word insidious to proceed slowly and harmfully. We have gimmick, which is a trick or device to draw attention. We have some other ones that haven't come up yet. But we also want to make mention that Faber has given up hope. Montag has uh, come up with this idea, this plan to use books to set traps and burn firemen's homes. But uh, Faber says, no, I don't think that it will help. So he does not believe in this idea and tells Montag to go home. Montag's hands picked up the Bible. He saw what his hands had done, and he looked surprised. Would you like to own this? Faber said, I'd give my right arm. Montag stood there and waited for the next thing to happen. His hands by themselves, like two men working together, began to rip pages from the books. The hands tore the flyleaf, and then the first, and then the second page. Idiot, what are you doing? Faber sprang up as if he had been struck. He fell against Montag. Montag warded him off and let his hands continue. Six more pages fell to the floor. He picked them up and wadded the paper under Faber's gaze. Don't, oh don't, the old man said. Who can stop me? I'm a fireman. I can burn you. The old man stood looking at him. You wouldn't. I could. The book, don't tear it anymore. Faber sank into a chair, his face very white, his mouth trembling. Don't make me feel any more tired. What do you want? I need you to teach me. All right, all right. Montag put the book down. He began to unwad the crumpled paper and flatten it out as the old man watched tiredly. Faber shook his head as if he were waking up. Montag, have you any money? Some. Four or five hundred dollars. Why? Bring it. I know a man who printed our college paper half a century ago. That was the year I came to class at the start of the new semester and found only one student to sign up for drama from Ashilas to O'Neill. You see how like a beautiful statue of ice it was melting in the sun. I remember the newspapers dying like huge moths. No one wanted them back. No one missed them, and then the government, seeing how advantageous it was to have people reading only about passionate lips and a fist in the stomach, circled the situation with their fire eaters. So, Montag, there's this unemployed printer. We might start a few books and wait on the war to break the pattern and give us the push we need. A few bombs on the families in the walls of all the houses like Harlequin rats will shut up. In the silence, our stage whisper might carry. They both stood looking at the book on the table. Well, I've tried to remember, said Montag, but hell. It's gone when I turn my head. God, how I want to say something to the captain. He's read enough so he has all the answers or seems to have. His voice is like butter. I'm afraid he'll talk me back the way I was only a week ago. Pumping a kerosene hose, I thought. God, what fun. The old man nodded. Those who don't build must burn. It's as old as history and juvenile delinquents. So that's what I am. There's some of it in all of us. Montag moved toward the front door. Can you help me in any way tonight with the fire captain? I need an umbrella to keep the rain off. I'm so damn afraid I'll drown if he gets me again. The old man said nothing but glanced once more nervously at his bedroom. Montag caught the glance. Well... The old man took a deep breath, held it and let it out. He took another, eyes closed, his mouth tight and the last exhaled. Montag. The old man turned at last and said, Come along. I would actually have let you walk right out of my house. I am a cowardly old fool. Faber opened the bedroom door and led Montag into a small chamber where stood a table upon which a number of metal tools lay among a welter of microscopic wire hairs, tiny coils, bobbins, and crystals. What's this? asked Montag. Proof of my terrible cowardice. I lived alone so many years, throwing images on walls with my imagination, fiddling with electronics radio transmission has been my hobby. 
My cowardice is of such a passion, complementing the revolutionary spirit that lives in its shadow, I was forced to design this. He picked up a small green metal object, no larger than a 22 bullet. I paid for all this. How? Playing the stock market, of course, the last refuge in the world for the dangerous intellectual out of a job. Well, I played the market and built all this and I've waited. I've waited, trembling, half a lifetime for someone to speak to me. I dared speak to no one. That day in the park when we sat together, I knew that someday you might drop by with fire or friendship. It was hard to guess. I've had this little item ready for months. But I'm almost let you go. I'm that afraid. It looks like a seashell radio. And something more. It listens. If you put it in your ear, Montag, I can sit comfortably home, warming my frightened bones and hear and analyze the fireman's world, find its weaknesses without danger. I'm the queen bee safe in the hive. You will be the drone, the traveling ear. Eventually, I could put out ears in all parts of the city with various men listening and evaluating. If the drones die, I'm still safe at home, tending my fright with a maximum of comfort and a minimum of chance. See how I play it. See how contemptible I am. So interesting thing that Ray Bradbury again predicted. Uh, the radios that you could just insert into your ear and would transmit both ways, which we have now and we see in all sorts of spy movies and things. Um, but uh, for this, it was futuristic technology that wouldn't be invented till way after at least the year 2022. Montag placed the green bullet in his ear. The old man inserted a similar object in his own ear and moved his lips. Montag! The voice was in Montag's head. I hear you! The old man laughed. You're coming over fine, too, Favor whispered, but the voice in Montag's head was clear. Go to the firehouse when it's time. I'll be with you. Let's listen to this Captain Beatty together. He could be one of us. God knows I'll give you things to say. We'll give him a good show. Do you hate me for this electronic cowardice of mine? Here I am sending you out into the night while I stay behind the lines with my damned ears listening for you to get your head chopped off. Well, we all do what we do, said Montag. He put the Bible in the old man's hands. Here, I'll chance turning in a substitute. Tomorrow, I'll see the unemployed printer. Yes, that much I can do. Good night, Professor. Not good night. I'll be with you the rest of the night, a vinegar knot tickling your ear when you need me. But good night and good luck anyway. The door opened and shut. Montag was in the dark street again, looking at the world. This is where we would end our chapter. Let's add in the final of our notes. We have the words Harlequin, a court jester or flashy outfit. Uh, using this, you can kind of get uh, an understanding if you're a fan of Batman, where Harley Quinn comes from as the Joker's girlfriend, um, would be a jester. We also have Welter. It said that there was a Welter on his table, which is a large chaotic array of items. I also want to make sure that we add in these last notes, one that Faber knows a printer that might help. We also have that he agrees to teach Montag in exchange for the Bible. We have that Montag asks for help and Faber gives him a radio so that they can communicate. And Montag goes home while Faber begins the resistance. And then finally, in our last notes, Faber believes that it is best to just sit back and let the world burn because nothing more can be done. That is where we will end our reading for today. So we mentioned uh, that there was a reference to Martin Niemöller's poem here, and then they came for me. So let's read this really quickly, and hopefully you can draw the connection between the two. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And there's been a whole bunch of variations of this poem uh, since it was first written, but it all comes back to the same thing, which is what Faber had alluded to, 
uh, that when things were going wrong, he regrets having not spoken out because when it was his turn, there was no one left to speak on his behalf.